introduce the panel because um, we all had a chance to meet our co-chairs already at the beginning of the meeting. But I would like to welcome uh, particularly uh, His Excellency Heile Mariam de Salen, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia, who has joined this panel. So there's also a very specific reason um, why you are here, uh, why you are sitting here. Um, what we would like to do is uh, to have again a very interactive session. I will ask uh, the panelists three questions in a row, but afterwards I would very much like to, to integrate also the audience into the discussion. And my first question to the panelists is, what are actually now the ideas you take home? Um, uh, what are the proposals? Uh, what, what, what is your take home value? And I may ask, and I may start with the governor. Thank you very much. Well, what I have um, been witnessing in the last couple of days since we've been here at the forum is that uh, certainly the mood uh, has changed um, from that of the forgotten continent um, to that of a continent that holds hope. Um, there is no doubt in, our, in, in everybody's mind represented here and those who are going to be learning about the optimism um, from some distance uh, that while we pat our, ourselves in the back uh, for what is now um, a continent that is, not, that is associated with opportunity, uh, we, we cannot afford to be complacent. There's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, the first of which I believe is um, we have a lot of homework in um, uh, putting together building blocks towards, among others, uh, effective institutions um, good governance, um, compassionate, forward-looking, uh, political leadership, as well as macroeconomic stability. Uh, we have to know that um, uh, investors who, who are continuously wooing to uh, look us uh, up positively will take their capital where they believe it is going to be productive and it is safe. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us uh, to ensure that we embrace this global capital. Embracing global capital and investment from outside requires us to put in place new conditions, turn the right corner for new business conditions. We have to make sure that we compare with the best international benchmarks as we do this. And then, of course, we have to remember that Many of the countries in the continent are landlocked. That requires us to uh, put in place effective <clears throat> communications and transport infrastructure to facilitate movements of goods and labor. Again, when international capital comes um, to our countries, it's going to bring with it the, 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 the fact that we will be assuming new uh, additional risks. What we have to do is to learn quickly how to manage these risks. The thing to do is not to run away from risks. It is to manage the risks. Now, moving on again with respect to this global capital, we have to know that we need to be welcoming, much more welcoming than has been the case hitherto. We have to recognize that when investors come into our countries, they are going to have to own some aspects of the economy, and we can't afford to be xenophobic. We have to f find a way of embracing um, uh, a global capital in a way that uh, there's a win-win um, uh, 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 situation. We, we get a lot out of it, and we also make sure that those who come into our own localities um, uh, realize a contribution to their bottom line. Last but not least, there's been uh, a message that has been bended in the last couple of days 
And that has to do with the fact that certainly growth and development uh, are different. They are not the same thing. What we need to pursue with increased vigor is inclusive growth, as I said in the, in the, in the opening plenary um, a couple of days ago, inclusive growth which will certainly generate additional employment opportunities and contribute immensely towards poverty reduction. Who, who do we in include in this inclusive growth? There's absolutely no question, and I will reiterate the message I conveyed at the plenary. Include women, first and foremost. Because again, you educate a woman, you educate a village, you educate a society, you educate a country, and you educate a continent, ultimately there is an enlightened move forward with respect to educating everybody worldwide. You also have to include youth. Do not forget the fiscally challenged. Thank you. Governor Moholo, um, listening to you, you started out to say um, Africa continent of, continent of hope. Um, and what you said afterwards, I think we should turn from this uh, Africa continent of hope much more to a terminology where we can speak about Africa as a continent of action. That's, uh, hope is always something which is in the future. And what we want to see here is a continent of action. Tim, would you summarize your, your proposals, impressions? Thanks, Klaus. I, it's been really a, a, a terrific couple of days. Uh, I, uh, the, the sense of energy and, and passion in action uh, that you feel from all the things that have taken place here and the people I've encountered has been, uh, has been really terrific. I like to kind of frame my remarks in two areas. One, kind of what needs to be done, and then secondly, how to go about doing it. I, I think that in terms of the what needs to be done, uh, it's pretty clear. There are roadmaps out there that talk about what needs to be done in a country, on a continent, to, to bring forth capitalism, innovation, growth, and wealth creation. And there are things like strong infrastructure, access to technology, strong education and healthcare systems, talent development, innovation, access to capital, good governance, streamlined regulation. And, and we know that list of things. And so the question in my mind is, is not what needs to be done. There's many roadmaps to lay that out for us. I think the real challenge is how do you accomplish those things? How do you do those things? How do you get institutions, government, business, and people to come together to set aside their self-interest, their cultural differences, and say, how are we going to unify to capitalize on the tremendous opportunity here in Africa? How can we look for certain things, if it's infrastructure, healthcare, education systems? What should we as a unified continent of 53 or 54 countries say, we're going to work together to create the best system we can and make it across the continent so we can unleash the power of the people of Africa and capitalize on the opportunity? And to really do that and make that happen, you have to think about how you operate differently. And from government standpoint, you know, how do we ensure we have accountable and fair governments? How to make sure there's streamlined regulation and a regulation framework across governments so businesses know what the rule book is and how to execute? What things are people willing to give up control on? How do we enable trade across barriers and continents? How do we make sure we have access to talent and free flow of talent? From the businesses standpoint, how will businesses invest in the long term for Africa? How will the business invest in training and development and take some of the responsibility for the skill development that has to take place here in Africa? How will we make sure we're inclusive across this? How do business develop new business models? Think of what's happening with the mobile phone and the financial system. How can we take that type of new business model? Don't think of the old ways of doing things, the new ways to do things and apply it to other industries. Make sure businesses think about all stakeholders, not just their investors, employees, but the communities in which they live, the unemployed, those that haven't been engaged in the wealth creation. 
how do businesses become active members across their community? And for individuals, how do individuals take the accountability to develop their own skills and to make sure that they're transforming themselves so they can participate in the transformation of this continent and across the 53, 54 countries? And then finally, I think, how do you make sure that system that's created is fair, is transparent, is inclusive? And everybody in that system, every aspect of it, continue the effort that's been made here in Africa to drive down corruption and bribery and unleash the power of the continent. When I talked about our opening session, I talked about great risk, great challenge, and great opportunity. I think the risks are clear and those can be addressed. The challenges are many, but they're very much worth the effort when you look at the tremendous opportunity here in Africa for all the people. And Klaus, that's what really, I think, makes me excited. And I hope that we come back next year, there is some progress made around those key issues and what we're going to unify and work together on. What we will do, we will, um, you, you just were speaking about progress. Uh, of course, what we are doing is to note uh, the ideas and proposals made here. And when we have our meeting next year, we will come back and look uh, what progress really has been made uh, related to the different issues which have been mentioned here. Now, um, Empo, do you want to summarize your, your impressions? Thanks, uh, Professor Schwab. Um, one of the questions that uh, I've had to reflect on a lot with uh, fellow South Africans and some of the delegates I've been coming across has been the question that some people have been asking me, is the WEF, what is the value add of the WEF? Is it a talk shop? Is it uh, this and the other? And I thought it might be useful to start there. Um, and in reflecting, my sense, there's this uh, Hindu proverb that says that uh, there's nothing noble in being superior to another human being, but that true nobility lies in being superior to your previous self. I think all of us here have to reflect and say, uh, we all arrived here in Cape Town uh, with certain perceptions and certain mindsets about Africa and where we are. It is my hope, uh, in this instance, uh, Professor Sharp, I'll come to the action, but it is my hope that uh, people feel that they are better informed, uh, they live here with better insights than they had when they arrived. So certainly I found that to be my personal experience. Uh, and as ASCOM, we've been part of the WEF uh, for the full 21 years that it's been coming to Africa. I also want to go back to where I began uh, in terms of an area of passion, I guess, coming from the sector I come from. That really, uh, I, I still wish to make that passionate plea for energy investment in the continent so that we bring about vast improvement in access levels to energy. You know, in ESCOM we say electricity is like oxygen to the economy. Now that we are in agreement that Africa is a, not just a, a pie in the sky opportunity, but it's tangible and we're all optimistic about it, I think we need to ensure that we urgently ensure that we invest in, in that oxygen for the continent. Then I wish to offer three uh, reflections moving forward. Firstly, to say what has become clearer uh, through and through, uh, it, it's very clear Africa is vast and diverse. Uh, but I think that we may want to reflect uh, as Africans whether we, it wouldn't be useful to have Africa with dialogues, uh, style dialogue, at the hub level, so SADC, uh, the East, the West, and so forth, so that when we go to the Africa WEF, we go with a build-up of having had prior dialogues through our economic blocks, so that again we move from hope to action, but much more tangibly at the regional block level. I think what it will do is it will ensure that more people have access to the conversation, because uh, numbers are limited in terms of if you can accommodate 1,000, 1,200 delegates uh, at the Africa WEF, perhaps we can get more contribution and deepen this optimism at the uh, regional block level. Secondly, 
I think that we need to urgently, very urgently, ensure that we put together a Africa talent database. I know there's various efforts in various instances. There are talented Africans out in the diaspora. There are talented Africans within the continent. And because we don't talk enough amongst ourselves, we tend to still lament this notion of Africa not having adequate skills. Yet there's lots of Africans in many parts of the world that are making the global economy tick. And I think it's important that we really harness that. Uh, and lastly, uh, what came clear in one of the governor's session, and it also came clear when we had the president of South Africa and the cabinet ministers, that there's a prospect of a north-south infrastructure uh, integration that is in the pipeline due to be implemented very soon. Uh, that for me was really heartwarming because it says something tangible is now going to happen in terms of ensuring that we do achieve that inclusive integrated growth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Makwana. Um, let's uh, turn to Mr. Tinubu. It's been a, an exciting three days for me. Uh, I think there's, without a doubt, substantial enthusiasm for the new position we see ourselves as a continent. There's confidence in our ability to deliver on those promises. I see that from all the sessions I've attended. And um, I think what I've been most enthused about is also the fact that there's alignment in terms of what we need to do to deliver on, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the promises for, for the continent. Um, I've been particularly excited by the fact that I think everybody realizes now that we're not going to get a foreign benefactor who will come in here and invest plenty of money if we do not decide to, to lead ourselves. And I say that because we need to lead from a perspective politically first, which is to ensure that there's an enabling environment of peace and tranquility. I mean, it's a tall order, so it's a challenge, you know, but it's something which we, we are actively pursuing. And that leadership comes from an inclusive, um, inclusive systems, political systems to ensure that people are inclu included in the way and manner that decisions are taking so that we don't end up in, in strife like we've experienced across the continent. Um, we need to improve our educational systems um, to improve the quality of personnel that exists on the continent. If not, when the foreign investors do come in, because we have, the, we have a peaceful market and, and an enabling environment, for example, the issues have been mentioned about China investing and bringing quite a lot of, uh, of skilled workers, and when they build these massive railway lines that we expect to see, um, what's going to happen for, with regards to the transfer of technology. I think it's incumbent on us to realize as a continent that we do need to, as we create a, a, ver a veritable destination for foreign investment, we do need to ensure we have the skills to take the opportunities that are provided by, by it. Um, it's also been a period where I've seen the fact that the leadership also will extend to entrepreneurship because there's no doubt that in an informal environment like the continent, like we do, the informal market is often much larger than the formal markets, and entrepreneurism is critical. And I say entrepreneurism from as little as, like we, we had a little dinner the other day on Nollywood, from as little as entrepreneurs creating movies out of, out of a lack of opportunity, um, being able to build it to a $250 million industry and spreading their, their, their joy around the continent. Um, they're displacing what would have been, to a certain extent, foreign movies in our local environment, up until the regional growth champions, which the WEF has already identified, being able to build $15 billion businesses, which are world-class businesses, African entrepreneurs, African shareholders, African um, um, skills, being able to build businesses across the continent thus driving the ethos of regional in integration because the continent is made up of quite a number of um, areas where we have and we have not, but all the resources typically are located in the continent, be it energy where we have 10% uh, um, um, of the world's oil reserves, for example, substantial water resources for, 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 for power as well too, um, or skills where we discovered, for example, that uh, Transnet in, 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 in South Africa is churning out extra spaces for railway technicians, for, for um, 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 
power technicians, for example, via ESCOM, um, that exist where we can do a skills exchange. And I would look forward to be able to see uh, basic quick wins of regional integration, where something as simple as even the movement of businessmen across the continent uh, is visa-free, for example, where borders, the exchange of trade, where we can have key performance in the cases that says we can move goods and services between borders within a, within a short, sensible period in time to encourage intra-trade within the continent instead of exporting um, all, the, all the opportunities we have to the rest of the continent. I think those will be my few comments. Thank you, Shubhan. Pito? Well, I was reflecting that uh, it's not so long ago the titles of newspapers about Africa were the lost continent. And uh, then afterwards it moved over and talked about the continent of the future potential. And my feeling is in this meeting here in Cape Town, we were living the reality of an economic development. And it was a confirmed economic development. And again, the fact that seven, uh, that seven of the 10 fastest growing economies of 2010 were African countries is just a confirmation. So that's a huge journey in a little space, a little time, if you think about it. Now, we also heard, and I think it was pointed out very clearly, that economic development is a sine qua non, it's a precondition for social development but not necessarily it is assuring social development. So my first question that I take away is, will Africa's economic boom allow to break the cycle of poverty? That's, that's a question that I would put uh, and still have. And if we look at the one billion of the population and when we recognize that 700 million are below 23 years, and when we think about what economic growth, we would need just to assure that we have sufficient jobs and what investment would be necessary. So I think this is one of the questions where we perhaps still have not all the answers. There's another reality that 80% of extreme poverty in Africa is concentrated in the rural area. Therefore, if you ask me about three proposals, my first proposal would be further improve the business enabling environment which has to do with policies, certainties, infrastructure in order to increase agricultural investment in Africa. Only then will we be able to target where the 80% of extreme poverty is and I think poverty reduction is certainly one of the most important things that we can achieve. As a European I think we also should remind the donor countries of their commitment which has not been fulfilled. It was a big announcement at L'Aquila, but I don't think everybody has fulfilled what was being announced. So I think this is another recommendation. The other recommendation would be, let's still give the Doha round. We have not discussed Doha round, it didn't even come up. But I have not yet given up on the Doha round. Let's still give the Doha round a last chance, but not longer than at the end of the year. If it's not going through the end of the year, at least let's save the trade facilita uh, facilitating decisions which had been agreed upon. Because I think a lot of the problem that we had of, of inter-African trade would be overcome if we at least would take the trade facilitating uh, decisions. And finally, I would say, assure access to adequate nutrition for all Africans. And this includes water, it includes macro and micro uh, nutrition food security. Those would be my proposal. Peter, if I may immediately follow up with a second question to you. When we look at all the different projects which have been discussed, uh, the World Economic Forum, is a community, it's certainly the foremost multi-stakeholder community in the world. It's based on interaction, global interaction, regional interaction. It's based on insights, which has been mentioned, but it's also based on impact. 
And uh, I have here a list uh, which I don't want to read of um, all the different concrete uh, proposals and ideas which, which were made and the reports which were published, like the discussions on competitiveness uh, where we created with the Africa Competitiveness Report, a benchmarking system, uh, the Africa Progress Panel, uh, what we did in uh, social entrepreneurship, what we did uh, for young global leaders uh, signing a, an agreement to foster young global leaders, and so on and so on. Uh, as I said, it's a, a list with about 17, 18 points I have here, and I don't want to, to, to read them all. But for you, Peter, what was the most important initiative um, action taking place during this meeting uh, you feel passionate about? Well, I don't think you would be surprised if, if, if I say that the signing of an agreement between uh, the South African government, represented uh, by the Minister of Water and Environmental Affairs, Edna Moleva, uh, with uh, the World Economic Forum and the Water Resource Group, was certainly for me uh, the highlight because it was action and it was a commitment from both sides. The creation of a public-private partnership uh, which will help uh, to uh, fill the gap of uh, the water resources that Africa needs in order to be able to further grow. Uh, we have identified that this gap was about 17% uh, in the next coming years, which uh, have to be found. Uh, we have identified that about 20% of this could be done on the supply side, most importantly, 80% of this will have to come from a better water efficiency, the way how South Africa is using the water. Uh, so I thought that for me, this was of course one of the highlights uh, because we have been able to move and to get action on the ground. Any other panelists uh, of our co-chairs uh, who, who would like to mention a special initiative he felt was particularly important for him or her. Thanks, uh, Professor. I think that if I can borrow from the list that you uh, were referring to just now, the, the, the package of ideas that fall under this notion of fostering Africa's new champions is an idea that I wish to pick on. Especially the ideas that I've picked on uh, you, in yesterday in one of the global regional uh, governor's sessions, the, there was the story of Tanzania that also surfaced of the benefits that came with uh, liberalization of the Tanzanian economy and uplifting efficiencies. And the particular thing that emerges from there is that we need to make the notion, the idea of building robust private sectors uh, an urgent priority because the private sector creates opportunities, it creates the jobs, which are much needed, not just on the continent, but everywhere else in the world. And so if we could really accelerate that as well as part of moving forward so that we promote true, true entrepreneurship, because that's where the job opportunities are gonna come from. Mm -hmm. Governor? Well, in the midst of um the good that I've been witnessing since we began two days ago. Um, I have been uh, very impressed and um, let, let me use the word hopeful again about the increasing number of young global leaders that you have been able to get them to, to get together. Um, we, we have to be seen not to be paying lip service uh, to this um, inclusion of the youth uh, so that they can be able to move the agenda forward of everything that we stand for. Um, I, I, I particularly was, 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 was humbled by the inclusion of the fiscally challenged in, in these young global leaders. Uh, and, and to me, I, 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 can, I can retire from whatever I'm up to with an element of optimism, knowing fully well that um, the agenda that we currently have and, and, and lots and lots of things that we have not been able to accomplish um, in a 
in our, in our, in our professions, respective professions, will be, will be taken forward. Now, we have been meeting as um, the, the, the WEF for, for a good number of years now. And uh, over time, we have certainly taken um, the, 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 the issue of women a lot more seriously incrementally. Yesterday, there was a get together of women um, and we still lamented the same issues that we lamented when we first uh, decided that uh, women, you cannot uh, progress the African continent without including all that women stand for. Now, I, 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 I hasten to uh, just let you know, some of you who are not in there, that one of the resolutions we, we arrived at is revolution. Why is that a lackluster clap? <laughs> Thank you, Sean, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, but, I, I certainly uh, feel in great sympathy with you. Um, Tim, what was the initiative project? You know, there, there was one that was mentioned by a company which I found interesting. I think it was Transnet mentioned a, a project where they need 600 engineers uh, a year and they set up a training and development program and instead of training 600 for themselves, they trained 2,000. So there would be 1,200 or 1,400 engineers in the marketplace for other things. And I, and I thought, Klaus, that was a, a great example of looking at broader stakeholders, bringing business together with the community, and not only doing what's right for their business, but doing something that's right for the community. And, and that struck me that if every business took that type of mindset and that type of investment in the talent of Africa, and then we could extrapolate that across the continent, uh, that's a kind of on the ground, actionable, tangible program that can really make a big difference. And I was mm -hmm. struck by that. Thank you. Chuba? Um, I think the two, two basic uh, issues one was the African Center for Public Policy. I think it's very important that we understand that as economic prosperity occurs, you find a lot of talent that should be in the public sector shift into the private sector, and that happens a lot. And I think certainly having um, a leadership center or centers across regional areas would be a good idea so that the um, global standards in terms of how we should project and plan to, to develop the continent from a political perspective be, be, um, be ascertained. I think the second point was one of regional integration. I thought it saw that there were concrete steps being taken by a lot of the panels I went into on the commercial side regarding trying to ensure that business can be done within the continent. And that's, as I said earlier, and I think it's, a, it's particularly of, 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 of great importance to be able to understand that the market merged is much more substantial than the market fragmented. With 48 states in the continent, um, different currencies, different systems, um, different taxes, different tariffs, different challenges. If we could figure out ways of aligning those uh, barriers to trade and, cr and turn them into opportunities for trade, there'd be a lot more intra-trade within the system. And the free flow of goods and services, talent, personnel, um, capacity, Capital, even. I mean, there's, there, there does need, there, there should be a, move, a, a substantial movement of capital because you do have countries and regions of substantial surplus who could well be investing in other parts of the continent, but actually have their investments in outside the continent. And I think these are these are areas which um, um, I've, I've gone home with, knowing that there is there are concrete steps being made. Let me add. Um two personal um, observations uh, in the same respect. The first one is we have now this meeting since 21 years. Uh, I'm, I have to use this opportunity to um, express a particular gratitude uh, to former President Nelson Mandela because when we came here the first years it was him who really supported uh, this type of, of, of summit. And um, uh, we, we wish him all the best for his health. And, uh, 
and express our deep uh, friendship uh, with him. Uh, now, the two uh, items which were, for me, very reassuring, and that's the first item also for Hilde, my wife. Um, when we came here uh, 10 years ago, nobody really spoke about social entrepreneurship. And we even had to explain very often what social entrepreneur means, because people were of the opinion social entrepreneurship means uh, companies which are socially responsible. Um, today, social entrepreneurship is well known and I would say flourishing in, in, in Africa. We have seen so many social entrepreneurs, not only in our own social entrepreneurs community, but many of the young global leaders, even many of the business leaders, uh, have somewhere an activity um, which goes beyond just being socially responsible, uh, uh, fostering really uh, people who on the ground drive social innovation. Now, the second point is, it's more an announcement, I should say. Um, we feel that in the stakeholder community of the World Economic Forum, we have women leaders, we have all the different uh, factions, but we are missing one community, which is the community of those in the 20s. And if we look uh, what happened in certain countries, what's going on in the world today, uh, this community, um, I, I mentioned in my, opening, uh, in my opening remarks, we have not only a geopolitical power shift, we have also an intergenerational power shift. Uh, power shifting to the young generation. And the young generation is not necessarily expressing itself in terms of um, voter, uh, votes and uh, elections. I think the young generation is mainly expressing itself through the new communication um, channels, uh, the social media. Um, and I have seen in this um, generation a lot of positive energy. Those people, they don't want to rebel to the country. They want to use the energy to build a better world. So, the, um, um, let's say, I came here with an idea which I tested very much in many discussions with you, and I may announce that uh, the World Economic Forum is building a new community of uh, what we call global shapers, which means um, hubs in each uh, major uh, city of uh, 30 to 60 uh, very well selected um, people in the 20s uh, who want to do good to the world and who want to use their energy in a positive way. And we think here, of course, of people um, uh, from business um, being self-employed, entrepreneurs or being employed, uh, but all other uh, stakeholder communities, uh, NGOs, and so on and so on. And we feel this group will very much implement, uh, will very much um, influence um, what we are doing in, in terms also of mutual uh, mentorship. I, I think we have to be mentored by the young generation and uh, we have a duty to mentor uh, the young generation. So this is a new, uh, a new idea which we will roll out in the uh, next uh, 12 months. And I think uh, in doing so, uh, we would like uh, to have a strong um, chapters uh, or shapers community in Africa when we meet next year to integrate the young voice even more into what we are doing. So uh, with the help of many of you with whom I have talked, I think we will make considerable progress uh, to integrate this part, this is a very important, crucial part of the population into what we are doing. Um, let me come to my last question before uh, involving the audience. And the last question is, um, you have spent now two days here. When you go home, what will you change in your organization? Or where will you put more emphasis on 
compared to when you came here. Maybe I start again with the governor because uh, we have, of course, interested to hear it from a political point of view, from a financial uh, point of view. What will you do as the head of the central bank uh, of Botswana, um, which may be a little bit different from what when you came here? Well, it's not an easy question to respond to, but um, um, we all know that um, there is um, a primary function, uh, not just of the Bank of Botswana, but all, of all central banks, and, and, and that is um, the maintenance of price stability. What I will certainly be doing um, with um, my eyes open and with more emphasis and ensuring that um, one doesn't blink is to continue to remember and act in a manner which will, of course, not forget the primary objective, but ensure that it doesn't uh, compromise uh, macroeconomic stability. Thank you. Which, of course, uh, macroeconomic stability suggests that we are going to have to uh, witness not just growth, but also development. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other um, of the, of the co-chairs? Peter, you will change something or emphasize, emphasize something more in terms no, I of think, uh, Nestle strategies? Yeah, I think uh, I feel very much reconfirmed in what we already have been announcing and I will assure that we now carry it through and this is that we want to make a $1 billion investment into Africa. This will include five new factories in different countries. We have already 27, it will take us to 32 factories in Africa, which creates jobs and, and important ones. But it will also include, and, and there I will make emphasis, it will include investments into the agriculture, not direct investments by uh, acquiring land, that's not our policy, but to ensure that through our Coffee, coffee plants and cocoa plants and milk plants, we help to develop the agricultural sector and especially with special emphasis, the smallholders by giving microfinancing and, and helping them with uh, technology transfer and this part. And I will not forget, uh, because it was mentioned uh, by the governor before, we will not forget that in these plants, women should have a predominant role. So this would be uh, two things. The third one which um, came out uh, during a discussion yesterday was a realization that Africa alone has more available rain-fed arable land than all of the rest of the world. And there was this discussion about the innovation impact we should not try to do what we have been doing in the Western world, but that we should find something different. So I was thinking about giving feedback to our R&D people to think about a green revolution for a rain-fed agricultural society. So that's, that's perhaps a fresh new approach that I will take home from this meeting. Tim, you have also something? I think three things. One, I. I would accelerate our integration of our business across the continent, so accelerate that. Number two, uh, invest more in our resources, our infrastructure and government in healthcare. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and number three, go back and look at our social programs and make sure that we are being inclusive and supportive of the development of the broader communities and things we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Tinubu? Uh, for me, I think I'd um, look have a policy internally in my, in my group that says Africa first, which basically means we would exhaust the ability or the opportunities to seek any good or service we require first within the continent before we make a call to Europe or the States or Asia. Um, there's no doubt that there's so much that we could do, um, we could benefit from um, by, by seeking uh, support from, from areas within the continent who, who really have competitive advantages in most things 
everything from education to technical skills to services to to ports or infrastructure that we need for, for our business. And, and also encourage the rest of the greater business community to, to seek inwards to, towards securing that. Because I've met quite a, a lot of wonderful um, uh, business groupings who are here, offering services, African in nature, African in orientation, who are doing very, very well in their communities. And I, I see no reason why we shouldn't um, seek towards um, our integration, but with small steps being taken by the private sector, as well in collaboration with the broader steps being taken by the public sector and the regional groupings. Yeah. Empo. Thank you. My, my sense is that uh, the best businesses that I have been a part of in my career have a high sense of an owner-manager ethos. Um, and this is what we've been trying to embed into the new DNA at ESCOM, that uh, people come to work more as, as if though they were going to work in their own business. And so that's what I'm going to be firstly looking at how uh, I can drive more into uh, the culture in, in the organization I'm leading at the moment. Secondly, a, a renowned feminist uh, taught us through her work a decade ago, that uh, we're the ones we've been waiting for. You know, if we all think that uh, uh, generations of leaders have been in various endeavors of leadership on the continent in a climate of Afro-pessimism, here we are, we find ourselves in this climate of tangible optimism. And so we need to, all of us as the current active generation of baby boomers and Generation X leaders born essentially in the past century, ask ourselves what it is that we can do more and better to ensure that these various areas of endeavor, the institutions, the companies and organizations and governments that we find ourselves uh, leading, how do we leave them better than how we found them. And from our point of view as ESCOM, we are a few months away from the COP17 in Durban. And uh, I'll be going back and saying to my colleagues, how do we accelerate uh, our implementation of our 100 megawatts of uh, wind and our 100 megawatts of concentrated solar power projects that we've been piloting so that we do indeed drive uh, from hope to action? Thank you. Let me, let me um, integrate uh, some statements uh, from the audience. I will take two or three statements, not questions to the panel, but just what, what will you change in your companies or more emphasize based on your participation here? Any, any comment? Yes? Sir Mohammed. <coughs> Mohammed Jaffa from KDD in Kuwait. I think this business of industry uh, returning water as clean as the water that it has received is a good thought. And this is something that I'll look into when I go home. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. Ambassador. Is there any microphone here for the first row? I'd like to add some Asian perspective, notably emerging economies uh, activity uh, the perspective. Definitely, Africa is becoming closer and closer to uh, countries from Far East, meaning China, Japan, and Korea, where I where I am from. I'd like to follow up with the recommendation what uh, uh, Professor Schwab said, really uh, mobilizing or gathering this young people, youth, to take more interest in Africa. And I'd like to really, when I go back, I'd like to see whether I could talk to some young journalists. And when they come and when they read, when they feel this energy from Africa, and I think they have so much to share with the society. 
I think that will be my um, contribution. Thank you. I will now turn to um, Deputy Prime Minister Desanen from Ethiopia uh, to give us shortly his impression and also to make an announcement. Um, thank you so much, Professor Schwab. I think this is my first uh, engagement in uh, uh, World Economic Forum. I am so much overwhelmed with information. Uh, a number of things has been discussed in a very short period of time. Uh, so for political leadership, I think this is a, a very good forum where you can exchange information and uh, see uh, what's going to happen uh, for the future of Africa. I don't think uh, hope is, uh, is the only thing because action has brought those hopes and Africa has been emerging as a, a growing economy in the world uh, setting. Therefore, I feel that um, the actions that has been taken, and the, uh, especially for the last 10 years, has brought Africa into this kind of hopes that Africa has hope that we can continue on uh, growing in the same fashion, even in a better fashion, so that uh, poverty will be eradicated from Africa. But I was asking myself, um, what is necessary to sustain this growth in Africa and development in Africa? And I was thinking that uh, political leadership, commitment, high commitment of political leadership is paramount important. And I feel that this commitment to, should be to the level of obsession towards uh, development, democratization, and good governance. Uh, otherwise, we cannot nurture a vibrant uh, private sector, which is the engine of growth for the sustainability of the African growth. So I feel uh, in this regard that uh, leadership commitment, especially political leadership commitment in Africa, should be uh, to the level of uh, the requirement of the sustainability of the growth to happen in Africa. The second issue is uh, most of my colleagues said that Africa needs an inclusive growth uh, because of the democratic, demographic structure in Africa. Uh, and we all know that the youth feels alienated uh, and, and the development process. And of course, uh, women are also not so much being inclusive in our development agenda. Uh, there is improvement, but still we feel that this is an important step that has to be taken. And this also needs high level of co political commitment uh, from the leadership side. Apart from that, everybody was talking about the capacity of Africa to discharge its responsibilities. And this needs capability in different sectors. And most of my colleagues were mentioning that Africa has nowadays have uh, homegrown policies and policies initiated from the African countries themselves. But the capacity to, dis to deliver and discharge, this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, these uh, policies is not to the level that Africa is now has to perform. Therefore, we need to build capacity uh, at all levels. And when we say inclusive growth, I think it should be clearly known that it should be also pro-poor growth, which is very important. The majority of Africans, uh, not only cities, but we have to see the rural areas, as was said, that the pro-pro approach, pro-poor approach uh, for growth is very, very essential in Africa. Uh, otherwise, if we see a trickle-down kind of growth, uh, which also uh, will not be uh, beneficial, and therefore a shared growth is very important in African setting. And these are, these are the most important you know, issues which I was conceiving from, from the discussions uh, which are undertaken. So Africa needs 
you know, to learn. There is no you know, proper sharing of experience between African countries. We usually see outside uh, when we want to share experiences, but there are best practices in Africa that has to be shared amongst African countries. And this also should be given emphasis because uh, the cultural issues, uh, demographic issues, all these issues are common in many ways to African countries. And the sharing of experience within Africa is also very important. As you said, the young leaders, there are uh, very emerging young leaders, uh, young uh, businessmen, entrepreneurs in Africa. And the sharing of experience in this kind of forums is very important. But beyond that, I think in every settings, we need to uh, uh, work very hard towards that. And therefore, f and in conclusion, I say that uh, African leaders has to take responsibility to sustain the already emerging growth and to diversify their economy. Because if we base our economy on resources, uh, and if not the productive sector is not uh, coming uh, very fast, then I think it will be a curse. So we have to, we have to work very hard in this line and uh, see that the pro productive sector is uh, uh, taking the major share in the growth and uh, also use the resources towards enhancing the productive sector. And good governance in this regard is very important. So corruption has to be uh, at a minimal level, uh, where if you cannot eradicate corruption, we have to uh, make it uh, at, at a minimal uh, <laughs> level. Otherwise, you know, uh, it is, uh, it's very difficult with a rent-seeking mentality to foster development and push development in Africa. So if, if you want to sustain uh, development in Africa, this is, uh, these are important points that I, I was trying to understand from the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. I, I just would like to, to uh, remind um, uh, our audience at the World Economic Forum, one of our um, uh, initiatives we are particularly proud of is our partnership against corruption, which has been signed by hundreds of, of companies. And uh, so it's a very interesting phenomenon. For example, um, uh, Robert, I think next week, um, we will be in Mongolia. We're under the, um, under the uh, leadership of the presidents. 150 uh, Mongolian companies will sign this um, uh, Pachi, as we call it, partnership uh, uh, against corruption agreement. And um, it is a zero base non-corruption agreement. It's zero base, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Prime Minister. So um, maybe, <laughs> um, but we, have uh, something else. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister will invite us to the next uh, summit on Africa. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Professor Schwabs. I think I'm so much excited and delighted uh, uh, to, s to hear that the next, the 22nd forum, the Eco uh, World Economic Forum will be held in my country, Ethiopia. And, uh, and I thank so much the leadership of the forum and the team uh, who has worked very hard to make this happen. And my government is so much overwhelmed by this and we are committed to make the forum success. Uh, for the next meeting in Addis Ababa. You know, Addis Ababa is uh, the diplomatic capital of Africa, and we are in the buffer zone uh, from the North Africa to the Sub-Saharan Africa, and we are ready to engage uh, the Northern Africa brothers and sisters to this forum. Uh, we heard that uh, 
uh, their participation has to increase in the coming forum. And as it was said, we are also ready to work towards including the use uh, in the forum, which has been given a green light from Professor uh, Now. So we will work towards bringing a new generation, the 20s, uh, into this forum. And my government will use all its channels, diplomatic channels, everywhere to make this uh, happen and uh, be successful. And we want to thank so much also the South African uh, government, uh, especially President Zuma, uh, for this uh, uh, very special summit, which is uh, very well organized. And we'll be learning from the South African experience, as well as the experience in Dar es Salaam last year. And we will make, make uh, our forum will be the best uh, learning <laughs> all, uh, from all our brothers the lessons. And uh, we thank you so much for that. And all of you are uh, very much welcomed and invited to come to Addis Ababa. Uh, this is a beautiful part of Africa and we invite you all uh, to come in. And my government is ready to host you and you'll, you'll have a rich uh, experience by uh, seeing into the old civilization uh, in Africa uh, and also uh, there is you know lots of cultural issues we are rich in culture uh, not only investment but uh, the cultural issue the tourism issue as was mentioned is also very important so you are coming to your ancestors because this is a cradle of mankind a place where the mankind has emerged. So don't feel that uh, you are coming to the outside world. It's your home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, o we all invite you. My prime minister is eager to come here, but because of uh, busy schedules, he was not able. And he asked me to convey to all of you this message. And please, uh, we want you to come, all of you, and invite you to Addis Ababa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. We are all excited to be in your country next year. We were very, um, let's say, encouraged also by your words and your emphasis on good governance, on democratization. Um, we are delighted that you uh, take up the suggestion to integrate so much young people also. I mean, it's, it's a business community and uh, political leaders, but we have to listen to the young voices. We will do it even more. Um, and I think there was, it was not easy for us to make a choice because we have so many good friends in other uh, African countries, Botswana, uh, Kenya, where we have a great uh, constituency, um, uh, maybe the political situation is not yet ripe in Kenya. We have, um, of course, Nigeria, uh, the biggest African countries. Uh, so there are many choices. Um, and certainly, one day, we hope to be in those countries. But um, it was important for the choice what you mentioned. We speak about Africa. We have to integrate also more North Africa. And I think uh, the location of Addis Ababa will be very favorable uh, to this uh, objective, particularly when we look now uh, what has happening, what has happened in North Africa. I think it's important to, to see next year uh, how we can contribute, uh, not only through the African Union, but also through the mindset of everybody to a higher African identity. So I think it was the right choice. We are looking forward and we are sure, Deputy Prime Minister, that we are in good hands. We are coming to the end and uh, I would like to uh, thank, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, there are so many people, uh, particularly you, the co-chairs, 
Let me start with the coaches. A great thanks to the coaches. <laughs> Second, all the participants, um, you have been tremendously engaged, and I, I, I can compare it with our other meetings. This was really a vibrant meeting. So um, thank you for making it interactive and successful. The government of South Africa, but my colleague, I, I um, would like to ask um, you, Catherine Tweety, uh, because you had the responsibility for the meeting to take now um, over from me. But before you are doing so, there are two persons uh, whom I would like to particularly mention um, who share with me and with Susan, the, the key responsibility for what's happening here. It's um, uh, our two managing directors who are here, um, Robert Greenhill, responsible for all the business engagement, and, <laughs> and Borge Brende. Borge, where are you? You see, that's a forum way. <laughs> someone has to be kept always busy. So, <laughs> Um, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schwab, and to, and to all of you. Well, it has certainly been a, a fruitful few days together, and I can safely say that our 21st World Economic Forum on Africa has been a great success. Um, I hope that you have all found the sessions and discussions and unexpected moments uh, not only productive uh, but very inspiring. And in keeping with the forum's mission and theme for this year's summit, from vision to action, the results have been tangible. In addition to incredible insight gained through our many public and private sessions, just a few highlights include the, the new public-private partnership to address critical water issues in South Africa announced by the minister and Peter Brabeck. Uh, we saw significant progress and increased support for our new vision for agriculture initiative and, and CADAP an AU NEPAD process for agriculture sector growth encompassing 25 countries which want greater private sector investment and announced this morning a new fellowship program for young African leaders made possible by Aliko Dangoti, president and CEO of Dangoti Group of Nigeria. Of course, as Professor Schwab mentioned, there are many others which will be summarized in the report uh, from the summit. I would like to take a moment to thank the many people who have played such an important role in bringing all the pieces together. A very sincere thank you to His Excellency President Zuma and the Government of South Africa for all of your support and congratulations on hosting a spectacular Moketi last night at the Cape Town Stadium. the city and people of Cape Town for being such gracious hosts, uh, the South Africa Police Service for their seamless operations, and to our city year students, students from Johannesburg, who have volunteered their time with us all week uh, to make the summit a success. Again, to our co-chairs uh, for being such great ambassadors uh, for this meeting. And we greatly appreciate the financial support and contributions from our partners and regional champions who supported the summit, many of whom participated in our first regional governors meeting yesterday. To Publicis Live for operations and logistics, to me it is always a feat of wonder to see what you create out of nothing. Um, and in particular, a, a very, very special thank you to the Africa Summit team my colleagues from the World Economic Forum, whose passion and commitment and minute attention to detail have made this meeting happen. And now looking forward, we are delighted that we will be making this historic move to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in May 2012 for the next World Economic Forum on Africa. Ethiopia, home to 81 million people, is one of Africa's largest economies and will be the third fastest growing economy in the world after China and Africa in the next five years. And with the headquarters of the AU, as mentioned, it is also the diplomatic capital of Africa, so extremely well situated 
to host this meeting. And I think the commitment by the Ethiopia community and the forum demonstrates our continued commitment to foster pan-African, multi-stakeholder dialogue and action. So on behalf of the World Economic Forum, thank you for being here with us this week and for your valued contribution. And we wish you safe travels and look forward to you joining us next year. Thank you. This concludes our 21st um, World Economic Forum meeting in Africa. Thank you.